is that it? Is it a metaphor for mental illness? Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new to the channel, hey, make sure you like and subscribe. I know for my regulars, y'all are probably like, girl, what is this? Uh, you don't do movie reviews. I don't. I don't. Like, this is actually gonna be a movie review, but not in the way that you think. Now, me, I am a scary movie buff. I love scary movies. I'm not really a movie buff, but when a scary movie comes out, I feel like I have to go see it in a movie theater. When It Chapter 2 came out, we ran to go see it. The movie itself, which is why I don't really consider this a real movie review, because I'm not going to critique the movie. It's just the parallel to mental illness that I got. And I couldn't help but wonder if that's where Stephen King was going with this whole thing. At first, I wasn't going to do it. I really wasn't because I was like, ooh, that may be too deep. But Duran and I, we went to go see the movie It. And it could have been that it was late because we didn't get out of the movie until 1 o'clock. But I left the movie like, oh my gosh. So I immediately turned to Deron like, I get it. I get it. And he's like, you get what? I'm like, I get it. Don't you see? I T squared equals mental health. And he was like, I thought it was about a clown. Is that it? Is it a metaphor for mental illness? I mean, but that's me. This is probably a very quirky and deep interpretation of a movie that was just meant for entertainment, but is it? I mean, it's not too far off. We recently found out that the Beauty and the Beast was pretty much a big metaphor for the AIDS and HIV crisis, so maybe that's where Stephen King was going with this whole thing, right? Oh, by the way, there are going to be some spoiler alerts, so... If you haven't seen the movie, but plan to see the movie, go see the movie, then come back. Or if you just don't care and just want to get the kind of mental health conversation, um, stick around. If you are not a scary movie person, don't worry. This video, you can still get a lot out of it. I think you're going to be looking at it in a totally different way <laughs> after I kind of give you my translation. So basically, if you're not even familiar with it, the whole thing is about a monstrous being that comes in the form of a clown. Um, he tortures the children in a small town called Derry, and basically he just targets their fears. He knows their secrets, he knows the things that they're ashamed of, and he shows up in the form of that. Don't that sound familiar? So he shows up as a false reality or tortures them with things that have happened or things that have not happened. To me, that is a lot like anxiety. Another parallel that I saw, um, one of the things with it is that he comes and goes. Every 27 years, it comes back. That's so much like mental illness and mental health issues. Something has came back and reminded us of the past and we don't know how to deal. We will be fine one minute and then the next minute we're struggling with something because we were triggered by, you know, who knows what. Maybe we ran into the person who broke our heart or maybe we found the item of someone who broke our heart. So just triggers that instantly put us back in that dark place, it comes and goes. In the movie, chapter two, these people have went on with their life. They defeated it in the past when they were a kid and it happened to them, but they've grown up and went their separate ways. And now it has came back and they're back in this dark place of fear, scared, don't know what to do. And if that's not similar to our mental health. So it as a character, the one that I feel that's representing mental illness is extremely scary. He's a monster. No one really knows what it is. They just know they don't want it around. He's manipulative. He distorts reality in a crazy way, in the most fearful way. And all they know is they just need to kill it. In grad school, we had to take movies and diagnose the characters. So I think I'm just kind of still stuck in that headspace. Just bear with me. Hear me out. Hear me out. 
So I'm just gonna start with a little bit of character development here. I think that everybody's it is different. Everybody's mental health struggle is different. We're just gonna run down a list of characters and the things that I feel like they are struggling with. So here's the gist of chapter two. Defeated by members of the Loser Club, the evil clown Pennywise returns 27 years later to terrorize the town of Derry. Once again, now adults, the childhood friends have long since grown their separate ways. But when people start disappearing, Mike calls the others home for one final stand. Damaged by scars from the past, the United Losers must conquer their deepest fears to destroy the shape-shifting Pennywise, now more powerful than ever. So like I say, everybody has grown up. They've went their separate way. Then we get a glimpse of what everybody is going through and what it is using to torture them. First we have Richie. Richie has grown up. He's now this big time comedian. He doesn't even remember the trauma or anything about Pennywise. He just knows that he left Dory. All of them. They've forgotten. All from Mike to come back. He is overcome with emotion and he throws up. And he's triggered so hard that he immediately pukes. He doesn't even know why. All he knows is that he got a call from a friend from the past because he doesn't remember. He has tucked the trauma back in the back of his mind. And so he doesn't even remember what he's afraid of. All he knows is that it brought up a lot of fear seeing his call. And so he just starts throwing up. So the backstory with Richie, we find out when they do like a little flashback that Richie was pretty much bullied um, at one point in time because he had an awkward moment while playing an arcade game with a friend. Um, the friend wasn't too comfortable with it and started calling him a bunch of gay slurs and started embarrassing him in public. They ran Richie out of the place only to pretty much run into it and it tortures him some more. It starts saying, you know, I'm going to tell your secret and pretty much just torturing him about his sexuality. Um, he has grown up with this memory, with this whole fear and that embarrassment, the embarrassment that stemmed from that moment. He has pretty much grown up with that. And I feel like that is his it. It is not just a monster. It is pretty much his mental health struggles dealing with wanting to come out about his sexuality. A lot of people are afraid to come out about their sexuality because of the stigma that society has placed. So with that, they'll battle depression, anxiety, all those feelings because they can't be true to themselves. All right, next character, we got Eddie. Eddie was my man. Eddie is dealing with general anxiety. Okay, Eddie is, he's a lot of us. Um, of course, he is meant to be entertaining, so it's extreme, but mainly his anxiety is health related. He is afraid of getting sick, and mainly because his mom has pretty much beat into his mind that he is a sickly child growing up, and so now he's, he's afraid of germs, he thinks he has cancer, he, the, everything, and y'all, that's me. I don't play about my health. So he is very cautious when it comes to things. So what does it do? And once again, I feel like it is just pretty much the metaphor for anxiety. It tortures him about doing things. So Eddie is now an adult. We find out that he is, you know, doing well. He's actually grown to be a risk analyst. How accurate but basically it uses his fear of getting sick germs nasty stuff to torture him um that's so much like anxiety anxiety fear of things that haven't happened or that could happen will try to keep you from doing brave things you know you're so cautious you don't want to leave the house you're fearful of just so much stuff that hasn't even happened and you're afraid to live your life all right then we have stanley stanley didn't really make it to do the, the last fight in chapter two because we find out early on that once he got the call, once he got that trigger from Mike, he committed suicide. 
we get a little bit of a better glimpse into Stanley growing up. And from that, I got that he dealt with depression um, as a child on into his adulthood. And when he got that final trigger of that phone call, he just couldn't take it. That is so much like what happens when people are dealing with trauma, they're dealing with our, their mental illness and their struggles. And then there's that one thing that happens to where they feel like they can't take it and they take their own life. That's why it is so important to deal with that thing, figure out what it is, because the more you try to suppress it, the more you're setting yourself up for a deep cut when it comes back up. Um, you can't run from it forever. It's, it's gonna come back and it may come back stronger and more powerful. And so you just gotta be prepared to deal with it. So yeah, we see that Stanley was pretty much dealing with depression even as a kid where they show, you know, as a kid hanging out in their clubhouse, Stanley was worried about things that a lot of them weren't even thinking about and some kids don't think about at a middle school age. You know, he's thinking about the fact of, you know, what about when we grow up and we're not friends anymore? What's going to happen? Um, he was very mature. For his age a lot of them said and they actually said that in the movie so stanley had things and was worried about i guess the downside of life at a very early age and he just carried that with him all right then we have ben y'all ben in chapter two is fine he fine ben and did all the push-ups he has done all the sit-ups and he is sexy However, the Ben that we knew, even in the old original classic It, you know, he was a little chubby kid, very poetic, very sweet. Um, and because of his size as a child, he had very low self-esteem. We see that even though Ben looks great now, he still carries the low self-esteem that stemmed from when he was a child or being that little chubby kid. Uh, and how symbolic of that, um, because yeah, even though we may grow up, we look good, we everybody tells us how fabulous we may be, we will still carry and see ourselves for that, that insecurity, whatever it was as a child. He was in love with a girl in the group, but because he didn't have that, you know, the look, he felt that he could not express his love for he still cannot work up the nerve to tell the girl that he wrote this sweet poem for it, that he loves her and that, you know, he he's the one who wrote the poem. And so it uses his low self-esteem about his weight to torture him, telling him that she's never going to love him, that he'll never be the person that she wants. You know, just trying to get into his mind that he's not going to be the stud that he has turned into. And hell, I do this now. So it knew that about Ben and he tortured him. Just completely being everything that mental illness tries to be in our life to keep us from living. All right, then you have Beverly. Beverly is the only female in the group. Beverly, I feel like they went there. The producer, Stephen King, went there. And in Beverly case, we got to see what happens when you don't deal with trauma and those issues. Beverly dealt with child abuse from her father. He was physically, emotionally, and psychologically abusive. And I couldn't quite figure out if he was sexually abusive. I, don't, I can't remember if they completely went there in chapter one, but he was definitely abusive. So we get to Beverly's life as an adult um, in chapter two, and we find out that she's married to an abusive man. And I was like, wow, nice. I see what y'all did there. And if that wasn't a key factor of how it pretty much followed her and she still was not able to escape dealing with her trauma as a child, she ended up marrying somebody who was just like her father. Even though she thought she got away with it and they killed him in the past, 
she still had some residuals and some lingering things that affected her decisions. So her it is the fact that she wants real love, but she has this abuse. Um, that she's remembering from her father and that comes in. All throughout chapter one, we see the abuse of her father. Um, even though she gets this sweet poem from Ben and she doesn't know that it's from Ben, she just knows that someone wrote her a poem and for her, it signified love. Well, she knows what real love is. However, when you are in an abusive relationship and that's all you have grown to know, it's hard to accept the fact that you deserve love. Whenever she finds comfort in this sweet poem that she received from Ben, it was always there to remind her of her dad's pain, of how her dad treated her. You know, even at one point her dad is completely insulting her and abusing her verbally, but then will turn around and say, no one will love you like I can. Oh, so, and just completely trying to boot out what she is starting to realize is love, it will remind her of her dad's actual pain that he caused. I really hope y'all following me. I hope y'all are following me. Then you have Billy. It's not hard to see. Billy is dealing with grief. He lost his little brother in chapter one. You know, the old classic of the little boy. He had the little raincoat on and he had the boat. And that's the reason why all of us grew up in the 90s afraid to walk by sewers. So yeah, his little brother was killed by it and he is dealing with grief he dealt with grief all in chapter one even though we're in chapter two and they're grown and adults we see that he is still dealing with the grief of his little brother and so it uses that it uses that to torture him about the fact that his little brother died because you know oh he didn't want to play with him and for the longest billy accepted that and if you're not careful mental illness and those things in our mind will talk us into a false truth it will tell us that things are our fault when in fact they're not and someone's passing can be hard to accept especially if you feel like you know you could have done something to change it but you really couldn't have so it constantly, I mean, that's the only thing he got. It's the only thing he got to use against Billy. He constantly shows visions of his little brother um, dead with scratches or whatever. And he, he'll flat out say, it's your fault. It's your fault that I'm dead and you should have played with me. Just all of this guilt. The beautiful thing is we start to see Billy fight back against what it is trying to tell him that it is not my fault and I'm, I gotta let you go. I'm not gonna save you because in each little vision or scenario that it plays out, he tries to put Billy in a bad position to where, oh, you can save him this time, but it's really just a trap. At the end, Billy came to the realization that I cannot save you and I'm not going to try to save you in this false reality. I'm going to accept what has happened and stop blaming myself. All right, then we have Mike. Mike is pretty much, he's the person that has brought everybody together from the beginning. To me, it was kind of hard to figure out what Mike was going through, but um, what Mike was actually going through was pretty obvious, I guess. He's dealing with PTSD. We find out that Mike was in a fire when he was younger and his parents died in that fire. Mike had dreams of leaving the town to you know, become something great. After that fire and after it, he ended up staying. He was the only one out of the crew that stayed in that town. Just still focusing on everything that happened. Focusing on the fire, focusing on it. Um, ready to fight. He was ready to fight. But whenever it came back, Mike was like, let's go. The thing I like um, that Mike did, we see in chapter 2 where Mike is, you know, going through all the old stuff, all the old news articles about Derry. And we see where there's an article written about his parents, um, about the fire, but it says two crackheads die in a fire. We see that that has been bothering Mike even as an adult. The fact that they wrote that his parents were two crackheads. So I think it definitely contributes.
contributes to a little bit of his PTSD and he has held on to that. Um, so what we see in the end is that Mike has did a little bit of narrative therapy here and he redid that article and he wrote two people died in a fire so that is key if you know anything about narrative therapy is basically where you just rewrite the story of your trauma you retell your story in a way where it's going to benefit you and help you to heal so we see him ending up doing that in the end all right and then you know we have harry who is like the town bully he also came back in chapter two um harry is just a sociopath he's borderline personality disorder um antisocial he is everything crazy he is simply a bully and just an evil spirited person and so it uses his psychoticness to torture the people I guess in a life form. He killed his father in chapter one and we found out he's been living in a mental institution all this time um, and it pretty much helps him escape. He's back to help it with his mission. Um, I guess just in a human form. A lot of people that are dealing with stuff like that, like the mass killings and shootings, um, they have an it, okay? They feel like it is somebody that's telling them to do these things, um, and that is a serious mental illness. So Harry is on the serious mental illness side, um, the psychotic breaks and things like that. So in chapter two, so everybody comes together. Um, it is, you know, pretty much exposing or threatening to expose everybody for their secrets. He's like, I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're dealing with. I know what you went through. And so Mike calls everybody back um, saying, hey, it's back and we need to we need to finally kill this thing. Mike has been in town. He's been doing research on it, how to kill it, you know, what people have done in the past that worked. So he lets them know, okay, we need to do a ritual. I feel like that ritual was symbolic to religion and prayer. I know especially in the black community, you know, and religious community period, we like to think that all you got to do is pray, um, go to church, and you won't have any more mental health struggles. Well, that's not just it. And I think that that's kind of where this movie was lingering or kind of teeter-tottering on. Um, at least that was my interpretation because they came together to do this ritual that Mike has been studying about um, to get rid of it. They're, they're doing, they're chanting, they're saying this stuff, holding hands to try to kill it. And it shook it up a little bit. They start shaking the table. It's not a good thing. Okay? Not bad for the but it didn't work. Ultimately, they find out, like, okay, what, what's going on, Mike? Why is this not working? You've studied this. And it is laughing because, like, I'm more than, you can't just pray me away. You can't just do little rituals and then poof, like magic is gone. Because we found out that the stuff in the past didn't work. Mike didn't tell them the full story. These people did this ritual on it and they still died. They still struggled. And so Mike, he says, you know, they didn't believe. I thought it's because they didn't believe hard enough. That's why the ritual didn't work. He thought that they just did it wrong. Boy, I'm like, oh, this is, if this ain't mental health. Now, to me, if you're looking at this from just a movie perspective, I would be quite disappointing to find out that this classic monster that has been so evil and monstrous and terrorizing all of these people's lives can be killed with the easiest and most simplest tactic. From a mental health perspective, I thought this was the most powerful, beautiful ending <laughs> um, to this story. So they end up realizing that they could take its power by using pretty much what he did to them on him. They start to belittle him, telling him he's just a clown. So they start making it physically smaller. The way I relate this to mental health is I feel like when you recognize that 
these are your thoughts and they are not true they have no weight they are not reality you can start to minimize the thing and overcome it and step on it the way you need to and so when they made what he was doing bigger than reality and bigger than what was true he was powerful. He was scary. That's a lot like what we do in therapy. We try to pretty much help you understand what your thoughts are. Recognize them. You know, if there's a way that we can rewrite this story, let's. But let's take the power away behind those negative thoughts. Let's take the power away from that so that we can really start to heal and do something with it. Because as long as you're giving life to it, something that's not true, something that's really meaning to kill you, then you won't be able to get over it. You gotta make it smaller. You gotta really see it for what it is, which is just a thought. Even though I know that you have to diagnose um in the field of counseling and things like that i don't like labels like for instance i don't like when people say i have depression or i have anxiety i prefer people to say i battle depression or i battle anxiety because you cannot let that thing have you we battle you know we can battle depression basically when depression comes i fight it now sometimes we don't have the skills and that's when you do need to go to counseling you need to do what you need to do to get rid of it but when you say i have depression or i have anxiety um i have ptsd you're pretty much taking it and just letting it sit over you like a wet blanket when you are really wanting to fight I feel like those key things you should say is that I battle. I battle depression. I battle. That means instead of giving in to depression saying, you know what, I'm just going to, I want you to lay in the bed all day and do nothing and sulk and cry because you're miserable and no one likes you. Battling depression would be saying, you know what, I am going to wake up and get up and do something very productive. In fact, I'm going to make myself a great breakfast. I am going to call up a couple of friends just to tell them I love them. And I'm going to be a productive member of society today. It's doing the complete opposite of what it is telling you to do. Woo! So I'm glad I got that off my chest, y'all. I was sitting on it. I was sitting on it and I was like I'm not gonna do this video because it's too quirky it's too crazy but I, I just had to get it out anywho I hope all of it made sense if not my bad I hope y'all enjoyed this video let me know if y'all want me to do more reviews it probably won't be movie reviews because I don't watch a lot of movies like that like I said unless they're scary movies but I do watch a lot of reality tv shows mainly in the perspective of diagnosing some of them folks too so let me know if y'all want me to review some of the stuff that's been happening on tv because i definitely can but please make sure you like and subscribe so that y'all can you know see when i upload another video hit the notification button and i will catch y'all later bye